Tatsil, and he's from the F.H. Johanneum University. Okay, okay, so you, you should be able to hear me now online, is that correct? Okay, okay great, thank you. So we're now going to hear from Dietmar Tatzel from Austria, from the F.H. Johanneum University of Applied Sciences, and is here today to talk to us about his uh, presentation, which is Towards Post-Method ESP and EAP Teaching. So welcome. We're here, we've done it, we've made it, over to you, thank you. Thank you, can you all hear me online as well? I yes. guess so, yes. okay, great. Can you just uh, expand your, the um, screen? Well, Hold on, I will come and you. Yeah, that's it. No, 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 uh, welcome right to the presentation. Oops. Oh, this one, this one? This button? This button? Yep, yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. What a relief to be sitting here and speaking without the mask, actually. <laughs> I should have submitted more papers to have more opportunities to speak <laughs> without the filter. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. And um, um, yeah, the Towards Post method is in EAP teaching. Welcome to the talk. Um, let me show you what you can expect. I have uh, actually first a short introduction to the background of my university institution so that you get an idea of where i come from and then i'm going to uh, present um, uh, basically from experience my teaching concept that i've developed and further developed over the past years uh, with seven cornerstones and then we'll draw some conclusions uh, at the end <clears throat> so the uh, F.H. Joanneum University of Applied Sciences is the largest uh, university of applied sciences in Austria. Um, it's a teaching university with research, which means that um, most of the research is actually going on uh, in the content fields of students. Um, and there are some, there is also some research in language teaching yeah? and in, in other fields as well. Uh, but there is a clear focus uh, on the career fields of students. We have uh, three sites with the main campus in Graz and about 5,000 students at the moment, 17,000 graduates and 750 employees. Uh, we have 69 degree programs, 28 at bachelor's level and 41 at master's level. And we don't have any PhD programs because these are uh, reserved for traditional universities in Austria. Uh, there's a variety of areas that we are involved in, from health sciences over to journalism, media and design, uh, architecture, social work, business and management, and engineering. And engineering is the department uh, where I'm based. <clears throat> the Institute of Aviation um, is my home institute, so to speak. Uh, we have three programs, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, um, which lasts for three years, with 39 places per year full-time uh, in the field of aeronautical engineering, and the instruction of this program um, is in German. Then a Master of Science in Engineering for two years, uh, with 25 places per year full-time, and this uh, has a particular um, characteristic because it's taught in English, which means it's an English medium program where all the content courses are taught in English. Uh, the idea was 
to give our students the opportunity of actually continuing after the bachelor's in the same field uh, with a master's to complete their uh, professional education. And then we've got another uh, master of science in air traffic management for two years uh, with 16 places uh, biennially uh, and it's an in-service program targeted at um, participants who are uh, somehow employed already and who want to do that on the side to, to get a master's on, uh, on the side, so to speak, which is also why we uh, charge 3,900 euros per term, um, which is not the case in the other two programs. Uh, and the, introduct the uh, instruction of this uh, program is in German and in English, uh, but mostly in German, actually. And then we've got an aviation lab, especially reserved for practical teaching uh, courses and also research that is going on in the field of uh, aeronautical engineering. Uh, so what when I'm talking about ter teaching tertiary ESP and EAP, uh, just a few thoughts uh, to link also uh, this uh, talk a bit to Mario's uh, plenary speech today. I think uh, <clears throat> what is essential for us in this field is as instructors, to be flexible, creative, and open-minded towards changes and towards uh, new opportunities that we can integrate into our teaching. Uh, and I think we need to focus really on the intersection of ELT and the content disciplines, because that's the area where we need to uh, base our courses. And I think this is also the area where we can be uh, really good at. Uh, then uh, students, future professions and career fields, obviously, but I think equally important are participants' individual and institutional needs. We need to take into consideration uh, where do our students come from, what, are their, what is their academic reality, what is their individual reality, in a way. And uh, I think if we uh, have a look at that, and if we consider that, <clears throat> we can be more responsive to change, to uh, quote uh, Darwin from Mario's uh, plenary again. Um, <clears throat> a post-method teaching concept, which is, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, basically, uh, this, these are the, the theoretical um, aspects that I think are important nowadays also. Uh, holidays, appropriate methodology, uh, Kumara Vadivelu's post-method pedagogy, and complexity theory, both in the theoretical uh, framework and also in the uh, pedagogical application as actually uh, suggested by Mercer in 2013. So, uh, try making sure that um, let me switch. Making sure that our teaching is uh, communicative, dynamic, adaptive, inclusive, uh, open, versatile, and actually can be expanded, refined, and renewed in an ongoing process, uh, just on the way while we are uh, integrating and um, um, expanding to new trends and developments. Um, so, what uh, in my context worked really well in the past is a focus on the lexical approach, mean, meaning especially collocations, chunk, chunks of language, language uh, because like from Lewis and Lissenberg and Bors, uh, because collocations uh, in technical terms are very common, as we all know, and uh, we um, can also use these rather um, easily to build exercises and activities. And this is also a way of blending uh, language with disciplinary content that um, gives us the opportunity to actually uh, create meaningful activities for our students. Um, then content and language integration in higher education. Uh, so where do we take our content from is, I think, a valid and often asked questions question among uh, professionals and teachers. Uh, <clears throat> I think disciplines of students, the professions where they are going to uh, be based after their studies and the institutions that represent these disciplines and the uh, professions uh, are the, the three main sources for the, for the course contents as well. And then uh, what do we do with the contents? Well, I think the basic um, idea is to prepare for EAP, to prepare our students for uh, coping with the demands of the study program and then make them uh, ready for graduating from their programs. And after that, also, we need to 
keep in mind all the time the ESP focus for their workplace. What will they be able to do and what should they uh, do after their graduation with the contents from our courses? <clears throat> the um, task-based language teaching stream uh, has also proved to be um, very useful because tasks can be adapted easily, as we all know. Uh, Widowson from uh, in 1983 already authentic uh, talked about authentic tasks, uh, authentic tasks in, in the context of engineering, technical uh, uh, communication, etc., genre-based writing, scientific communication, technical communication, and academic register building, to some extent. And um, just uh, also maybe to link uh, this back to uh, the um, one of the uh, talks in this uh, session earlier. Uh, if, even if students don't maybe or may not be sure what they need after their studies, uh, I think that in, in companies uh, a lot of a lot of um, writing that um, professionals do and need to do uh, is high level technical scientific writing yeah? and therefore academic uh, writing scientific writing uh, also has a, a, a valid place in the professions. Um, <clears throat> then multimodality, we've also heard about that before, uh, but uh, I think long, long before the pandemic, uh, multimodality was uh, a, a reality in many professions, especially engineering and, and uh, technology, where texts formed uh, part of electronic databases. Uh, and on the other hand, um, uh, technical texts that were produced for internal use or for publication also by companies, they relied on uh, laboratory, laboratory work and EP. So, for example, measurement data, analytical results, and graphical representations that had to be integrated into comprehensible, meaningful uh, texts in decently or uh, decently written English, I would say. Yeah. Um, then, <clears throat> authenticity as a key element of tertiary uh, teaching. Um, there is a dilemma to some extent, of course, as we all know. Uh, the authentic professional target language uh, mm -hmm. is an ideal in education because it's pedagogically, mo uh, as soon as it's pedagogically motivated, it's no longer authentic, really. However, uh, formal education is a real profession. So we, I think we have uh, no reason to, uh, to hide this truth. Uh, there are educational scenarios um, for example, also innovation and ELT that can be combined and blended to uh, a meaningful scenario for our students or meaningful scenarios. So in ESP EIP, the goal of authenticity uh, is there, but it's, it remains an attempt at future work realities. Uh, nevertheless, even though it's an unattainable goal in the very end, we've got semi-authentic pedagogical events that can be even more meaningful than just the authentic application that students will need or do after their studies. Because when we are there as teachers, as instructors, we are still here to interfere, to uh, guide, to improve uh, the language that students uh, need and use. Um, needs analysis, we've uh, heard a talk about uh, great needs analysis with uh, many different factors before in this session. Um, taking students, major disciplines, studying into account, curricular contents, target professions. So the first three points are essential, I think, but equally important are the, the, the last three, individual study goals, uh, the personal interests and social affiliations of our students. We need to uh, yeah, create our courses around uh, what is relevant to the individual as well, not only the, um, the disciplines and the institutions, but the individuals in our courses, because when they feel that our teaching is relevant, I think that will strengthen also our position uh, for future um, survival. Um, how am I doing with time? Uh, you've already spoken for 11 minutes. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> learn autonomy, um, the final seventh point and cornerstone here, the founding fathers of learn autonomy, Oleg and Little, uh, also defined autonomy as a goal of education, uh, because I think it's the, the the ultimate um, target of all our uh, efforts to enable learners to perform independently uh, in target situations in their professions, but also in social life. 
so <clears throat> this is what we are aiming for as teachers. Um, so post-method ESP EFP teaching, to quote Kumara Develo from 21, uh, a teacher-generated theory of practice, which is an adaptive concept uh, integrating learners, content disciplines, and future career fields as such an adaptive concept. It allows for a lot of uh, flexibility, and therefore I think it's ideal for the um, 21st century and all the constant changes and challenges that we are facing. Um, it is an integrative approach. That means uh, you, it can uh, and should integrate educational currents, academic cultures, socio sociocultural experiences, uh, institutional contexts, uh, professional trends, and uh, global developments uh, as we go along. And actually, drawing some conclusions from that, uh, I finished with uh, learn autonomy as the uh, final cornerstone of this concept. And I would like to uh, build a bridge to teacher autonomy here, uh, which is essential as long as we as teachers uh, remain autonomous to, um, well, just make decisions in our daily work, I think, and as, as especially in the tertiary field, we have uh, an advantage here because we have the privilege of actually being involved in many processes where we, where we can make decisions. Uh, so this is essential because uh, teachers <clears throat> as drivers of education can make a change and can also expand uh, the teaching concept in that way. Uh, so further development um, as an essential element and um, in tertiary settings for ESB and EFP professionals, I think that this is the way forward that we need to keep uh, developing and keep uh, expanding our own teaching with new currents and trends and also making our position clear that we are there to uh, stay relevant uh, in the future as well. Thank you.